Okay, I have been preaching through the topic stewardship. When my mother was alive, and she would sit in her chair, all comfortable, all day long she would watch TVN, all day long, all kinds of preachers. And the TV would be on, she would be snowing. I said, Mama, are you watching? Oh, I'm watching, I'm praying. <laughs> <laughs> you know how quickly they would say that and they said, don't worry, can I turn it off? No, 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 don't turn it off. I'm listening. I'm listening to the sermon. I can understand my mother doing it, but I don't understand my boy turning the TV on all night long while sleeping. I just run through the window and it's still on. <laughs> Try to do that? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, young people do that these days. And uh, But when my mother watched those TV programs in TVN or other Christian channel, and sometimes I would sit and watch some programs with her. There are times some preachers, X, Y, and Z, would come on and say, Hey, God never made Christians to be poor. You send me $100, God will bless you with $1,000. Heard that right? And then Christians are not made to be poor. God is going to bless you. And oh, my mother would, you know, one day my mother even told me, saying that, give me $10. Why? The preacher asked for on TV. Mama, there are millions of others who are giving. You don't need to. I, I know the preacher. So I kind of said, Mama, don't do that. But she's believed in that. Just send that money. And then she would get angry saying that, where's my money? <laughs> you know that, right? Miss Beverly, you could relate to that. <laughs> All right, so, so some preachers preach that. And then there are some, I'll be honest with you, some would say if you're a Christian, you got to be poor. I mean, you got to give up everything, just be poor. And I thought to myself, I need to really find a balance in the Bible. There are a bunch of preachers who would preach, you got to prosper, that's what the Bible says, and they would quote a number of scriptures. As a matter of fact, uh, they, they, would, they would definitely quote in saying that, you know, God said, ask, seek, and knock, you shall find. God did not create us to suffer, he wants to prosper us. And, he, you know, there are about 2,000 plus Bible verses on stewardship, on money alone in the Bible. So I'm sure they will find a bunch of Bible verses that would support them. And they're not wrong in doing that. Well, where they're wrong, I'm going to bring it to you now, is that finding the balance. And then those that are thinking that, hey, pastor's got to live with the bag of potatoes. That's the kind of mentality, right? Poor. And that's, that's all Christians got to be poor because you've got to give up everything. Because Luke chapter 18 tells us that God told the rich men, sell everything. Give it to the poor, then follow me. If you want to follow God, sell everything. Now, how do you find the balance between the two? One bunch of folks, I listen to them all on TV, saying that, hey, you prosper, and you give it to God, and God is going to bless you, and you become multimillionaire overnight. And, of course, they would quote all kinds of stories that are true. I'm not blaming them. Solomon was the richest man ever to live. David was rich. Abraham was rich. And there are so many folks in the Bible that we read, they just... Prosper because God said so. I'm going to bless you and prosper. The very nation of Israel is prosperous. God said, I'm going to bless you. And then there are those like the disciples. And they were poor. I mean, these guys are fishermen. And they would quote Bible verses saying that the birds have nests and the fox have holes, but the Son of Man had no place to lay his head. Even Jesus was a homeless man. He had a borrowed boat and a borrowed house to eat and a place. He had no home. He was kicked out of his own house in Nazareth. And they were right in that respect too. Now how do you find the balance between the two? And what we as Christians must do when we think of stewardship today, that's going to be the lesson today. There are problems on both sides. And I'm going to explain it to you. And then I'll tell you what God and money means. In your notes, the first thing. Let's go with the problem with this poor mentality, people. People think that, hey, Christians got to be poor. You got to you got to give up everything, you know, to live, um, you know, down below. You don't have to worry about that. Now, what's wrong with that idea? And um, they have all kinds of Bible verses to quote, and I agree with them. The first thing is this: 
the the first thing that it's wrong with, they have a wrong presumption about rich folks. There is a presumption the person is making money financially rich, and they will automatically think there's something wrong with that person. He's doing something dishonest. He's not doing right, he's dishonest. That is presumption. The first mistake, these people who think that gotta be poor all the time is that they're dishonest. If they would really love the Lord and, and they would give everything, look at them, they're filthy rich. They somewhere, they got the money wrong. That's presumption. How do you know? Well, they presume it. The second that is wrong with people with this poor mentality is this. They exaggerate their own role of being a Christian. They do. I've heard them say this. They say that people that are poor, they gave everything to the Lord because they love the Lord more than others. I love the Lord, so I gave everything up. I had this car, I had this home, I had this, I gave it all up to the Lord, thinking that they have what you call the, the penthouse when they get to heaven because they gave up everything. No, that's exaggeration. They also sometimes do a mistake. I watched people like that. They would measure their life. Their life becomes a measuring stick for our spirituality. Look who we are, what we are, look at us. That's exaggeration. Third thing that's wrong with them is this. Sometimes they're extremely naive. They know they're dependent on those that are giving. For example, ministers, pastors, everybody's dependent on people's giving. Ministry is dependent on people's giving. The great Billy Graham depended on what people gave to his ministry. And at the same time, they would jump into the cesspool saying that everybody should be poor, give, but not everybody is called to give. I've heard people say. Because if everybody gives, they'll be out of business. I'm sorry to say that. Because somebody got to give them so they'll be fine, right? So they're very naive. And sometime, um, number four, they're manipulated. How do they manipulate people? Sometimes they would come. I've, I've heard people in my old churches saying in the prayer meeting, they'll stand up, Pastor Paul, God really told me to give everything up. I have this need in my life I want you to pray for. You know, I'll go right to them saying that. You don't need to say it in the prayer meeting. You know what it is? It is for others to hear so they can give. So that, that is manipulating. This poor mentality. And uh, this is me. Give it to me. Give it to me. Give it to me. And that's, that's wrong in this poor mental thinking. Wrong assumptions, exaggeration, extremely naive, and manipulative. Now that's what's wrong with these people who think poor. And let's come to the, the other side of the coin. I don't want to leave you there because we've got to find the balance at the end. What is the problem with these people preach about prosperity all the time? First of all, they have a wrong perception saying that prosperity is a sign of God's approval. They would preach to you saying that, hey, God blessed us and because God approved what I'm doing, that's why I'm rich. They're a little bit arrogant if you think of that. And God blessed me because God must have liked me over somebody else. That's why God blessed me. Something wrong. And they would put people on guilt trip of prosperity and healing. I'll tell you um, a very good example that I faced is that Miss Dot Warren in Bethel Baptist Church, her husband was dying. Jim Warren of cancer. And then one of the guys went to his, her house saying that, uh, you know, God will not heal you husband because you don't have enough faith. Went over after that. She was crying. I said, why are you crying? Because so-and-so came to my house and said that I don't have enough faith. I said, that is a bunch of baloney. That's the word I used. Show me in the scripture. That you don't have enough faith. You're a wonderful Christian. Don't worry about that. Because they would put on a guilt strip saying that, hey, look at, look, at, look at me. I'm prospering. You don't have that kind of faith that I have. That's why you don't have money. That's why you're in poverty all the time. And that's wrong. Some people do that. Nothing dumber than for somebody to, to get up and say that I serve God 
Therefore, God blessed me. God wants you to be prosperous. No, don't get me wrong. Yes. But we need to find the balance exactly what God meant. Because when, 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 you, when you talk like that, there may be somebody in the church um, don't have a job. Maybe they, they gave everything out. And they're financially strapped. And when you say, God bless me, that's the reason why, because I'm faithful. And they'll say, maybe I'm not faithful. That's why I'm poor. You know how bad that is? That's wrong. That's what they do. Put others on guilt feeling. And then they also have wrong motive. Just like what my mother would say, give me $10 so I can send to this man who is preaching on TBN. And that's a wrong motive. What it is is if you give me, and that's your seed money, that's the word they use, you know that? That's a seed money. You know, I, I got to think, I got to tell my mother, saying that, Mama, ask him to send me the seed money. See whether you would receive $1,000 from God. <laughs> and she, she would say, you're you a pastor, you shouldn't talk like that. And then she would chastise me. Uh, but I said, Mama, that's not the scripture. And, and uh, what, what does the Bible say? That's how those people behave. You know, they behave in such a way that God is obligated to help a person. It's like... I owe you floating around. God owes you. Now turn with me the scripture. Because I want to read. I don't want you to leave uh, thinking that, hey, Christians got to be poor and Christians got to be rich. But God said that very clear, whether rich or poor. Matthew chapter 6. Verse 19 through 24. Listen to this carefully. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up your, yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light is in you is dark, how great is the darkness? The key verse is this. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. Or mammon. Very, very beautiful teaching of the Lord Jesus. It's part of the Sermon on the Mount that he was preaching and teaching. No one can serve two masters. The word serve and master in the context. Service means being a slave. Now, people don't like the term slave because it is politically incorrect these days. But the re reality of the history is true. And if you really look deeper, slavery is being done in every country even today, believe it or not. It's called bond slavery. In India it happens. There are some bond slaves. Poor thing, they, they work under the rich folks. But then, the way that we treat them today is much different than how they treated in the ancient time, slavery. Slavery simply means that you don't have any means to take care of you, therefore I'll take you under my wings and help you come and live with me. And they're the servants. And of course there was some discrimination during the time of Israel in the early days, but God uses the term saying that, here it is, if you want to serve me, want to be a slave, and uh, then I'll be the master, that means I am in absolute ownership of you. Whether you have money or you don't have money, you are my servant. Now I'm going to kind of stay in there for a couple of minutes. Serving is a choice. In the Sunday school lesson, I think service was mentioned. If you don't get Brother Stan's lesson, maybe you should leave your emails with him. He'll send it to you 12 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> 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 no, I'm just kidding. Exactly. Sometimes 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock. The first thing, as soon as I get up, when the alarm goes off, I hit the button on the phone. Guess what? Stan McCluskey. And his lesson is there, so I tried to read. 
And, and today's lesson is also starting with service. It is apparent that Jesus is telling all of us to serve. Whether you're rich, you're called to serve. Whether you're poor, you're called to serve. And then God said, take my yoke, which means shoulder with me. If you're rich, shoulder with me. If you're poor, shoulder with me. What it is, is that you are, uh, you're yoking with me. We are walking together. Therefore, your priorities are my priorities. And your mindset is my mindset. Have you ever, ever seen a farmer plowing the land? Now we are in tractors and all that, right? In the olden times, they have two oxen, and maybe you even see the picture of a farmer holding the plow. And God said two beautiful Bible verses. He said, when you put your hand on the plow, don't look back. That's number one. And when you put on the plow, make sure that they are equally yoked. Because if one is not yoked uh, right, guess what? That is going to pull on one side. They are trained to walk together, and you put your hand on the plow, and you have the straight line, your land is tilled, so you could sow the seed. When God said, you're supposed to serve me, that means you are yoking with me, and you and I are together in this. He never said, hey, poor people, and I want you to yoke with me. Hey, rich people, I want you to yoke with me. He said, all of you who follow me, yoke with me. Because when you yoke with the Lord, you would have those, you would not have those presumptions. You won't have their extreme naive mentality. You won't have the mentality, I gave everything up, uh, so I am the best spiritual person in the world. You don't have all those comparisons. Well, once you yoke with Him, guess what? Your possession becomes His possession, and your cares become His care, and your joblessness becomes His joblessness, and then your nothingness becomes His nothingness. You think God is going to let you plow with Him like that? He is not going to. He's going to provide for all your needs because you're yoking with Him. If you're not yoking with Him, guess what? You're going to pull one side and God said, uh, come on, come back in. Pull with me so we can plow the land together. That's what serving means. Serving is a choice. You make the choice. You can do both. You can go after money in the world and say, I'm joking with you. You can go on the other tangent saying that I'm a poor guy. I'm not going to do anything. God will supply all my needs and sit and wait all day long. God said, yoke with me because you have work to do. We can be together. Serve. Secondly, the choice that we make leads to submission. To who? To the master. Because our master has got the absolute control. You don't have a control. I don't have a control of my life. And guess what? God has the control. Sometimes it is very difficult to give the control over. <coughs> that one preaching that I did several years ago in, in Savage, the illustration I gave, guess what? Who remembers to this day is Mr. Benny. You would always say, remember? One thing you got to be careful with him is that he would always quote my own sermon back to me. So, <laughs> so you got to be careful with him. And I remember preaching once several years ago saying that. He said, take all of your keys up. And they did. I said, okay. And then uh, here's my keys. And I held on to one key saying that here, here's my keys. He said, no, no, no. You're not giving the whole thing up. You're holding one. How can you hold something and then give your keys to the other person? I gave you the absolute control. You can't. That's what we always do. There's some pet peeve always in our mind saying that I'm going to hold on to this. There's something that pleases me, something that I'm enjoying in my life, something that no one can see it, no one can touch it. I do it in secret and nobody sees it. This is my pet peeve. I'm going to hold on to it, Lord. And I'm, well, I'm giving you 99% of the keys. God said, no, you're not. That is not absolute submission. Sometimes even the poor or the rich, they do that. Lord, I'll just hold on to something. I'll hold on to my bank account. I'll hold on to my checkbook. I'll give you everything else. God said, no, no, no. Because you're going to yoke with me and give the whole thing. Then you're giving everything to me. The poor would say, Lord, I gave everything, but I haven't given my arrogance saying that, you know, I'm committed to you. You're going to bless me. You know, that, that's kind of a mentality they have. That's wrong too. You know, God loves you for who you are, not because of what you give. Because God doesn't want that. 
God does not need our money. God does not need our time. And God wants us to serve Him. That service leads to submission because you submit to the Lord and you give everything voluntarily. Lord, you're my master, so I give everything to you. My job, my family, my time, my talent, my tithe. Do you know tithe is not man's idea? It's God's idea. Seed money is man's idea. <laughs> God never said in the Bible, you give money and I'll give it back to you. Tithe is God's idea. You give that to me. And then thirdly, submission leads to dependence. First, service is a choice. We choose. And our choice leads to submission. And submission leads to dependence. That means you totally depend on God to make the moves in your life. How can that happen? One day I was teaching a Bible study, you need to find the will of God. And then I'm going to, you know, one person responded to me, yes, pastor, I've been praying and praying and praying and praying God to give me a job and God never gave it to me because I want to do the will of God. Okay, then I asked, did you apply for a job? Did you call somebody? Did you call me whether I know anybody in church who could help you? I said, no. So why would I? I've been praying every day God will send me. Good illustration. Years ago, in the last century, there was a name, a guy by the name of George Mueller, lived in England. And this man had orphanage. Big orphanage. There was a guy from the street, got into his orphanage. And when the alarm goes up at six o'clock in the morning, he wouldn't get up. All the other boys, if you're in boarding school, you know, from a childhood, I was in boarding school, I know that. Six o'clock, you got to be up. There'll be somebody watching you, but they're going to get up from you. But not from your house. You know, we had a trick. We had uh, a bathhouse. We need to go and take bath. The whole thing, I'll take my blanket with me. Because <laughs> I can't get up at five o'clock in the morning. That's terrible. <laughs> Ninth grade, five o'clock, take the blanket and go to the bathroom and then close the door and sit in the corner. And they sleep and won't take showers, just brush teeth and go straight to the prayer, <laughs> prayer room. And then they will find me saying that I said, did you take that? Oh, yeah, I did. No, you don't smell like taking that. You know, you lie. Those are all become, before becoming a Christian. And, and, and uh, what I was going to say is this. Dependence on God, totally. George Mueller had this boy. Six o'clock, alarm goes off, you won't get up. One day, he was a street guy. Second day, third day, fourth day. He wouldn't get up. So he called him. The boy came and said, uh, Hey man, why can't he get up 6 o'clock in the morning? When the alarm goes off, hundreds of other kids get up in the morning and say, No, I can't get up. I'm not used to it. I get up. I'm a steep kid. I can get up whenever I want to. I can go to sleep whenever I want to. You can't change me. And George Miller asked him a question. 6 o'clock, when the bell goes off, can you hear that? Yeah, I do. Do me a favor. Once you hear that sound, put one leg off your bed. Then the second leg would automatically come out too. And he thought it was fun, but he did that sincerely. He put one leg out, he was so uncomfortable, fell off. <laughs> so the story goes, true story, he got up afterwards. So, so many people, they would never put one leg out when they find the will of God. Do something! Then I did ask God, Lord, bless me. This is the effort. If that's not God's way, He's going to close the door. When God closes the door, don't go with the crowbar to open the door. And when God opens the door, don't just sit back and say, Lord, I don't, do I need to go in? Well, you need to show me all one, two, three, four, five steps so I can go in. Don't even think about that. When God opens the door, just walk right in. See, that's what dependence means. You depend on the Lord and then say, Lord, whatever you say, I would go in and I do my part and you're going to come alongside and help me. And you do your part by submitting yourself completely, helping your church, helping your ministry and helping your family, helping your children and helping everybody that you know. And God will come alongside and then say, I'm going to help you yoke with me because you are giving complete in charge of me, of your money, of your time, of your talent, of your church, of everything. I will take care of that. Yoke with me. Then the yoke becomes easy. Then we can plow the land together, till the land. Then when you put the seed, it's going to sprout up and give you tenfold, hundredfold, thousandfold. Folks, you and I don't do that. We don't want God to yoke with us, saying that I can, I can pull myself. And you pull one side completely and everything goes haywire. 
whether you're rich or poor, yoke with him. You can serve both. Here's something. Some people say, money will make a person happy. It's not me telling Gallup poll. Gallup poll said, what makes a person happy? They give six reasons. Good health, enjoyable job, happy family, a good education, peace of mind, good friends. There's no money mentioned in there. Now, where do you get all these from? From the Lord. Ask Him. He's going to give you wisdom. And money is not there at all. Gallup said, not in the Bible. Gallup said what exactly what God said, yoke with me. I said, no one can serve two masters. You could either serve the Lord and leave the other, or serve men and leave God. What it simply means, yoke with me. Whether you have mammon, money, or not, yoke with me. And it's easy. We can plow the land together. Give it all to Jesus, your finances, your life, your time. And then walk with Him. He's going to guide you. He would never let His folks suffer in any way. Because God said, I'm with you always, even until the end of age. You would go through difficult times. God never said you won't have a difficult time. You will. But God will be with you. That is the stewardship. God is with me because I gave it all to Him. Whether I have or have not. Who do you serve? That's the question I gave. Think about that. Who do you serve? Let's bow our heads and pray together.